Hello and welcome to episode 47 of the Rollo and Slappy Show. Today is July 10th, 2017. I am Rollo McFlugel and with me is Slappy Jones 2 and we're both at McFlugel.com. The show notes page for our episode is McFlugel.com slash 47. I'm going to pass it over to Slappy and he's going to talk about our episode. Thanks, Rallo. Thanks, everyone, again, for listening. This is part two of Vivek Raj's explanation of Bitcoin. If you missed the first one, I highly recommend you go back and check it out. He does a great job talking about what Bitcoin is, and, and he gets a little more in-depth in the second half. So enjoy. So earlier you were mentioning some of the altcoins. Yeah. Uh, anything you think is promising? Where should we be looking at outside of Bitcoin? So I'm personally a Bitcoin maximalist. <laughs> Um, because, well, there's a few reasons about it. I mean, maybe it's just sort of the crowd that you fall into. And I do think there's also a lot of correlation here. Um, the people that tend, this is just my own personal observation, the people that tend to support Bitcoin Core tend to be Bitcoin maximalists, whereas this crowd that supports raising the block size, a lot mm -hmm. of them are also fans of like things like Ethereum. You've heard of Ethereum. Yep. Monero mm -hmm. I was talking about earlier is Litecoin. Um, my belief is that is that Bitcoin is, it has network effects. It's the first cryptocurrency. It has a name recognition. It has the largest market cap, even though that gap has, um, has shrunk a lot in recent months. Um, and that it has this like stability to it where it's always, it's, the network has always kind of worked. Um, the stewards of the Bitcoin software, Bitcoin Core, have always been very conservative in their management of it. They don't push ag aggressive features. They don't even want to, you know, they're always very reticent about even increasing the block size because they don't want to put too much data on the blockchain because they know if the blockchain itself grows too fast, you know, it, it might no longer be decentralized. And when I, when I look at the landscape of these altcoins, I'm not seeing people actually using, you know, people use Bitcoin for stuff. Like I was mentioning, Backpage, dark net markets. There's actually an economy in Bitcoin. Even if most people are holding bitcoins, there are people actually using it for stuff. But when I look at the when I look at the altcoins, there's a lot of pump and dumping out there. There's a lot of scams. And in general, for any person in this space, I would just say stick to Bitcoin. Um, one of the things about Bitcoin is um, it had a very ethical launch. When Satoshi launched Bitcoin on, on January 3rd, 2009, he didn't, he didn't mine any of the Bitcoins secretly himself and only then reveal the software right. to the general public. To me, that's an unethical way. But when you Does look that at happen these, often? With other very people? often. Yeah. Yes, the pre-mine, right? Yes, can... that's a, okay. a pre-mine, yeah. A pre-mine, another, another iteration on that is called the Instamine, um, where this is, so have you heard of Dash? Yes. Yes. So Dash, like something like twenty eight percent of all Dash were mined on the very first day. <laughs> yeah. And guess who that went to? Yeah. The founders. Yeah. Guys who right. made exactly. it right. Exactly. Um all pretty much every altcoin apart from Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Monero were all pre mined or insta mined, or in some other way the 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 um the tables were tilted in favor of the founders. Um, of those of those coins, so Ethereum, for example, was pre-mined, um, or what should I say? Sorry, um, yeah, Ethereum I think was pre-mined. So a lot of the early, the early Ethereum was given to the Ethereum Foundation as early found um, founders like Vitalik and Gavin Wood. You've heard of Vitalik Buterin, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, he's he's the um, he's one of the found. He's the most prominent founders. Um, Dash was insta mined, and Evan Duffield and a large portion of the of the founding team took the early coins. Um, that's so true. It's just it, the story just repeats itself across virtually every cryptocurrency, apart from Bitcoin. Litecoin was very fairly launched. Monero was fairly launched. Basically, they released the software, and from the get go, anybody was welcome to mine it. Nobody was given an advantage. But then what happens is with these is all coins is. Um, is that so? So the people, the founders, they insta mine them, they pre mine them, and then now they have an incentive to once they they've given themselves an early set of shares. Now what they do is they just start going about hyping it. So oh my gosh, like Dash is like is the worst in this regard. They talk about like okay, they say one of the things they claim that their their coin is they call it private send. 
it's it's pure snake oil. Dash is not private in any way, shape, and form. They also have, they also claim that they're instant send. Where like you know if you send a, a Dash, it gets to somebody instantly. But the thing about it is the reason why Dash is instantaneous is because nobody uses it. Right. The minute people act, yeah, the minute people Dash actually start seeing significant volume, that claim will no longer be true. Dash is extraordinarily scammy. Um, so what what what, you, what you're seeing is like a community where noobs are buying in, and the thing is, because this stuff is all very technical, you know, I mean, even I'm not a very technical person, um, you know, I rely on other people to some extent. Some people, you know, they're new to this space, don't even have the years of experience that I have. Um, they can't, they don't have the capacity to evaluate these claims. I mean, Ethereum, I mean, that Ethereum is this concept where um, you're going to take, you know, they're, they're adding like a very complex programming language, and you can run these, what they call like uncensorship resistant applications. But like I've been, like I was saying before, blockchain is a very, very bad way to store data. Like it's, mm. it's so inefficient. You need the reason why I use a blockchain is for censorship resistant. So you look at these projects that are being built on Ethereum, and they have no need for censorship resistance. Like they're just like they're trying to basically replicate. I don't know, eBay or Facebook or this or that, um, like on on a blockchain, and it's like. If any of them actually receive any modicum of actual user base, the cost of operating it on the Ethereum blockchain will skyrocket. Right now, like for example, you've heard these ICOs. Explain that. Okay, initial coin offerings. It's a uh -huh. plan that IPOs. IPOs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So pretty much all the ICOs nowadays are are basically debuting on the Ethereum blockchain. So people buy Ethereum. And then they give it, and then the ICO happens on a given date and time, where um, a token which runs on Ethereum network, essentially like a, um, you can take like tokens on a blockchain, including Bitcoin, and you can label it in some way. So what these what these what these um, token sales are is some company will come along and say, okay, okay, you give us your Ethereum, and we'll give you our tokens that will be used for our application which we're still building. And so much money is being raised. There was like oh. some, yeah. Oh, there was some company that raised like 150 million dollars wow. for like, yeah, for like a nothing. Pro they haven't even made the product yet. <laughs> yeah, and it was like some of these things are really, really dumb. Like there was one that was going to be like um like a decentralized token for sharing workspaces. Like I don't really, I don't know why. You, a lot of them you don't need a token for the token. To me, there it's purely it's pure scams. They're just doing it to make money off of then these people. They're not even getting equity. These tokens are not equity in the company. What they are is they're the tokens to use that company's platform, which they have yet to build, and which has yet, even if they build it, to see any users. And even if they ha even if they did build it and it did see users, like I was saying, a blockchain is a bad way to run these apps. The cost of running it on an actual blockchain would lead it to be astronomically expensive. So I predict none of these ICOs will pan out. Huh. All these companies will just have made a lot of money. They'll cash it out. All the founders will get rich, and the people who invest their money will lose every dime they put in. <laughs> I don't think a single one of them will work out. Yeah, that's um, uh, that's a it's an interesting concept, though. I mean, maybe if 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 there's an application where there's gen a genuine need for censorship resistant resistance. And not only that, but there's a benefit to running it on blockchain versus just putting a server in a foreign country and then for payments using like Bitcoin, then fine. Okay, then then maybe that will work out. But I'm very, very skeptical um, of like all the ICOs. I'm skeptical of Ethereum because a lot of, to me, is a speculation built upon, you know, these ICOs. People are buying Ethereum to get to, into the ICOs. Um, I mean, that's pretty much true of all these, all these blockchain, all these altcoins. Is a lot, a lot of people that are new to the space. This, these altcoins have taken off really over the last three to four since March, mostly. So in the past four months. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, up, up until March, Bitcoin had a dominance of about like eighty something percent, or eighty something percent of the market market share was Bitcoin, and since then it's fallen tremendously. So what you're seeing essentially is that. You have a lot of pre heavily pre-mined, instant-mined coins, where the founders are controlling a vast majority of the um, of the coins, and then they sell off, they sell their the remaining share to 
people, they, they tout it, they make these claims that can't really be verified, and then people invest in it, and I think a lot of people are going to lose their money in it. So I, I would stay away from all coins in general. Now, like I was saying, there's a few that were that were fairly launched, like Nero and Litecoin. Litecoin is essentially identical to Bitcoin with a couple of tweaks here and there. It's like they, they say they're like silver to Bitcoin's gold. I don't know how necessary that is, but whatever. But Monero is actually a, Monero is actually a pretty decent project. Um, you know, it's and it's a it's a fairly anonymous chain, and there there is some demand for that. And in fact, a lot of the dark net markets accept Monero. Hmm. And from what I understand, a lot of a lot of um, some volume is being done with Monero on those on those dark net markets. So there's some promise there. So I, I'm I'm not like a hundred percent against all coins, and I they'll I mean, I'm they'll always exist. There's, right. no, there's almost no yeah. There's almost no barrier to entry to starting an altcoin. Anybody can just take the Bitcoin software, fork it, change a thing here and there, and then and then launch it. But I mean, I'm a yeah, skeptic. You could, yeah, you could really just change the name, right? And leave everything the same exact thing as Bitcoin and and launch yeah. altcoin. That's practically what Litecoin is. There's a few changes here and there. But yeah, so yeah, it's 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 interesting. I I dabbled in in altcoins a little bit. I was trying to do like some trading like three or four years ago, and it was funny. It's it it really helped me learn about you know markets and everything and and trading because I would yeah you know, I want to be a millionaire and in, in something. So I'm like oh let me put two dollars in here and get a million of these coins, and all of a sudden see the see the charts go absolutely yeah. wild, not realizing that I was the, <laughs> I was the one doing that. So it's kind yeah. of funny. I do think this Bitcoin Civil War has lent some like it, it gives this portrayal of Bitcoin as like being in chaos and, and disagreement. And so that maybe has lent some credence to it. I think the Ethereum Ethereum has just been heavily marketed with very duplicitous claims. Like they, they they're literally putting an ad saying it's the world computer and they they're saying it, Ethereum is the internet 3.0. Mm-hmm. It's like, come on, like like you you don't know that yet it's right yeah i, I guess mean, I'm, be, I'm accepted uh, yeah and even someone like me who um you know knows a little you know very little bit about bitcoin i guess more than the average person but compared to to people more involved knows very little i e- very easily be led into thinking like oh wow look at this you know ethereum thing they're making all these cool promises yeah, must be good. And probably, you, know, you, you just, you just any, assume that they're, you know. Anybody can make promises, but Bitcoin has a, has a pretty lengthy track record. And it's been through a lot of ups and downs, so I think it, it it's just it's just more stable, and it's safe. And I, I just I don't think it's worth it to gamble. Maybe some maybe it's like some FOMO. Some people felt like, oh, I missed the boat on Bitcoin, so yep. I'm going to invest in the next Bitcoin. That that's something that that's there's an element of that there. Um, I mean, I don't want to say that all coins will always come and go. I mean, and if you look back three, four years ago, there is just there's a graveyard of all coins past. There was an all coin called Aurora Coin, yeah, in like 2014. You remember that one? I do. Yeah, that that one had hit like um like a billion dollars market cap, and now we're at like 10 million. Wow. So um, I mean, Ethereum had a little more staying power. I'll give them that. Um. There was, I mean, there was BitShares. So um, BitShares was started by a guy named Dan Larimer. And this guy, what he does is he, he, he's kind of a classic scam artist. He starts a project, he touts it, and then he, of course, has it pre-mined. He gets this share. And then after like a year or two, he leaves. He says, we call, he turns the project over to the community. So BitShares was his first one. And that, you know, shot up with several hundred million dollars in market share. Now it's like $12 million market share. Um, then he started Steemit, right? Steemit was 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 found on this premise that it's going to be like a social media blockchain yep. where you'll be paid to post. Yep. Which I oh, mean, yeah. yeah. To me, it's like silly. Like, the, where's the censorship resistance? You know, I could start a blog tomorrow. I could post on Facebook tomorrow. Like, I'm not really being actively censored, right? I don't need a blockchain for that. It's a silly preposition well guess what dan lamber did he, he made his money and then he just recently left now he's starting he's starting another one a project called eos i don't even know what it's about i'm not i don't really care to learn about it but to me it's the latest dan lamber scam um you know i think i think that someday you know vitalik will leave ethereum he's made his millions 
and you'll turn on the product door to the community, and then eventually the energy will dissipate, and it'll go on to the next thing. That's what's going to happen. So, I mean, I'm skeptical about, about all coins and ICOs. Um, to me, it should be operated, it should have a fair launch, and it should be operated as an open source software project. That's what Bitcoin Core is. Nobody in Bitcoin Core is deliberately paid for it. Some of them are sponsored by companies, but um, nobody is deliberately paid. Um, there's no there's no Bitcoin foundation. There used to be one, but um, there's no Bitcoin foundation that like sponsors the development team. Hmm. The Bitcoin Core is a very loose affiliation of, of developers and and it's very meritocratic. Um, you know, the best ideas tend to float to the top. Um, Monero is the same. It's an open source software project. I think Litecoin is the same. Um, whereas a lot of these ones, like Zcash, have you heard of Zcash? Not familiar uh, with that Yeah, I, I've, I've only heard of it. Okay, so this is, it's, there's literally a Zcash company that um, I think they, they have a founder's reward. That's how they made their money off of it. So like a, a certain percentage of the mining block reward goes to the Zcash company, and that's how they make their profits. And they make claims of it. It's, it's one of those coins that center on being anonymous. And um, their claims of anonymity are greatly exaggerated. There may be some element of anonymity in them, but they use a technology called ZK Snarks. Now, from what I understand, ZK Snarks it sounds like zero knowledge. It's based on zero knowledge proofs. It's a relatively new cryptographic assumption um, of anonymity. And the thing about that is that being new, it's not, it's not a good thing. In the cryptography world, you want something that's older because it's had more time to be tested. Like, and, you know, if, if, if it's brand new, it could be that ZK Snarks could prove to be, you know, broken, poor, poor cryptography, you know, a year from now, somebody could find a hole versus you know, other forms of cryptography that are more longer standing, they've proved themselves resilient. Um, and then also Greg Maxwell, who is, who um, obviously has done a lot of the um, cryptography work in Bitcoin, he said that only like, in a recent lecture, it's only 4% of Zcash transactions are actually truly anonymous. So, you know, you know, is it, is, this is a very technical field and, if you don't have the, the capacity to value these claims, you're basically investing in something based on the promise of a founder. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's like anything else that's new. People get all excited about it and just know that it's something different, but don't know really the ins and outs of it and, and can very easily be taken advantage of. Yeah. Uh, another one I've been hearing a lot about is Ripple. And isn't that kind of like a centralized? Yeah, exactly. So I don't even consider it a blockchain. The Ripple, Corp the Ripple Corporation has literally been subpoenaed before hmm. and blocked transactions. Like, this happened a few years ago. They can block a transaction. So, to me, it's not – they just the, – the blockchain is pure marketing to yeah. them. Yeah. So, it's just it's, – it's just, it's just, yeah, blockchain bullshit. Like – and also, another thing we hear a lot about is private blockchains. So, you know, you're, oh, JP Morgan's testing private blockchains, or this company called R3, which is like trying to develop a consortium of banks together to test blockchain technology. That's nonsense. Like, to me, blockchain, if it doesn't have that proof of work algorithms, algorithms securing it, there's no point to a blockchain. Like, it's, there's no efficiency gained from a blockchain design. That's just, that's just like putting transactions in a block. Like that's just a folders is innovation here. Like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of BS here. And so that's why I suggest sticking to Bitcoin. It's the time test one. It's proven. There aren't also Bitcoin. There aren't like Bitcoin core. They're a pretty humble group of people. They don't make like these big claims about what's possible. You know, they don't, they don't, like, they're even, like, they're also very reticent about how scalable a blockchain is. And that's why they're trying to push the Lightning Network route. Right. Because, no, it doesn't, it doesn't scale well. They, they, they're, they're fully admitting, like, hey, it's not very private right now. There's a lot of science to be done here. And it has to be done, you know, slowly and steadily. You know, you can't snap your fingers and develop, you know, the world computer, as Ethereum says, you know, you know that's something that, you know, that's just, that's just out of, you have to be very humble about the science here. So right. what do you think to people who haven't bought Bitcoin yet? Did they miss the boat? 
I know the price was up around three thousand dollars, maybe a month or two ago. <laughs> so you asked me if it's if it's a good investment. Yeah, I mean, is it worth <laughs> buying now or is it too late? And I know you can't tell the future, but based on what you know. Yeah, I also even if I could tell the future, I, I hate coming off as somebody who's like trying to pump and obviously yeah, I own Bitcoin. Right. Yeah, I so do I. I do too. I own right. a significant amount of Bitcoin, and uh, I mean, or non negligible more than like you know probably majority of my savings. Um, I don't want to say that I'm pumping it. I would say, okay, it, like those things I was talking about, if you have a use for, if you like drugs, hey, use Alpha Bay, okay? Right. Uh, I may or may not have used it in the past. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, it, it, it exists. So, you know, you can use it for that source. If you have any of those things where Bitcoin solves a problem for you, you know, use Bitcoin. Um, it wouldn't hurt to put a small amount away. You know, Satoshi said a long time ago, you know, if this thing, he said, if this thing catches on, it might be useful just to it might be useful just to have a few in case it catches on. Right. Because there's only gonna be twenty one million bitcoins. It's in the protocol and I don't think that'll ever go away. So I mean the price is twenty five hundred now. I mean that that's a you know, it's pretty it's pretty high now. It might be worthwhile just to pick up one or two. I don't know. I mean like just it's have something there. Yeah. You have something, yeah. Um because not not more than you um I mean the obvious advice you always hear is don't invest more than you can afford to use lose but um yeah I mean it's, a lot of bitcoiners have this we have this very intense belief we call it, we're going to the moon we believe that bitcoin will be worth like a million dollars someday and who knows uh, maybe it will I, maybe it will maybe it won't but every time I've seen I remember it was like two years ago someone said by October Bitcoin's going to be worth you know. Ten thousand dollars a coin or something. That's like oh, yeah. okay. Well, well, yeah, it takes time. It has to catch on. People have to understand it if they're willing to put money into it. And I think there's, with my limited knowledge, there's tons of room for it to grow in more people coming in once they realize what it is. So, oh, yeah, you know, based on well, here, supply and here, demand. Well, here's some food for more, thought. Yeah. So last fall, I, could, I should actually email this article. There was an article in the New York Times, a really long piece, but it was fascinating, about his husband and wife that got divorced. Um, they're like multimillionaires. I think they were several hundred million dollars. They live in like West Palm Beach. And, um, and the husband was started hiding all his assets from his wife. He was putting his money in New Zealand tax accounts um, that were sheltered, you know, hidden. And then one by one, like the, the wife had to go to the lawyers and start like un, unveiling his his web of, of dummy companies and tax shelters until eventually he had to start basically give it up. And and, and the, his lawyers turned on him after a point because they started threatening the lawyer's bar license unless they you know turned him in or started turning over the funds. Um, and maybe a year or last year, you heard about that um, the Panama Papers leak. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, all the wealthy people across the globe were yep. hiding their money. So, I mean, this happens where people are trying to hide their assets from governments. And um, and the problem with these tax shelters, you have attorneys, you have accountants. They all take their cut, and they also represent – these people represent counterparty risk, where they're, they're people that can rat you out. Right. Um and I read that in the New York Times article I read there were there's approximately twenty trillion dollars in money held in offshore assets. Um, if just five percent of that goes into Bitcoin, the price would be about fifty thousand. Not bad. Not a bad return. No, I'm not, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just five percent of that twenty trillion dollars goes into Bitcoin, fifty thousand um, dollars. and that's you know, this, the the global drug market is several hundred billion dollars so if it like you know if bitcoin captures the global drug market which i think it will eventually because unless it legalizes drugs in which case bitcoin will be useless for that purpose um because you know then they'll just use traditional value writing transfer systems um then bitcoin will be worth ten thousand dollars i mean you go around to running the numbers and look at scenarios here and there and i mean i don't know if any of this will come to fruition but and to me, it's worth a shot. You know, I think so too. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, especially as if if it, I don't know if it's, it has been. T it's hard to tell because all these things are underground, and you can't really get good data on it in any kind of a black market. 
but if it starts taking on this 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 case this use case of being um, a store of value that the global wealthy um, begin using to hide their assets from government instead of having tax shelters that I mean that's tremendous in well la uh, last year when India started banning cash right small denominations to me I mean that's a Bitcoin subsidy. And, you know, every once in a while what happens is I'll be reading these news articles and I'll be thinking to myself, oh, man, why didn't they just use Bitcoin? Or, you know, I'll, or I'll read some, like, some, some news article about, you know, government passes new stringent regulations on this thing. And to me it's like, oh, well, they just subsidize Bitcoin then. You know, anywhere the government tries to be, to be um, very controlling of the, of, of the way value is transferred or, you know, they're, they're increasing tax rates and stuff. To me, all this stuff is just Bitcoin subsidies. Right. Bitcoin exists. Ironically, <laughs> it's a perfect irony for a libertarian. Bitcoin exists because governments give it value. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. If they got out of the yeah. way, we probably wouldn't really need it. But in that same vein, Bitcoin to me will, over time limit the size of government if it catches on because it represents it represents a store value that they can't access right it's kind of the way out yeah they can't i mean as long like i've said a hundred times as long as you have your private keys so you control yourself through your harder wallet your brain wallet your paper wallet although i recommend a harder wallet nobody can take that money from you um not even the government they could throw you in jail and you know if you get out in five years you know, you come back and you and you grab your hardware wallet wherever you stashed it. You know, and you know it's a small thing. You can carry a billion dollars on there. You know, you can carry you can carry a billion dollars on a paper wallet. You can memorize the codes and carry a billion dollars in your brain. Nobody can take that from you. Um, remember, have you seen the the Shawshank Redemption? Yes. Yeah, remember the the very end of it where um where uh, Morgan Freeman sent uh, Andy Dufresne to f uncover that uh the gold. Hidden near that tree in the middle of nowhere. Yep. Yep. I mean, what would that be nowadays? That would be like a Bitcoin wallet. Hey. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And like some of us jokingly call Bitcoin our prison wallet. <laughs> yeah. Um, if Breaking Bad occurred today, have you seen Breaking Bad? Yes. Okay. Remember, he he. Um, spoiler alert. He was he was uh, putting the cash in barrels and burying it on the desert. Would a would a drug dealer be doing that nowadays? No, they'd probably. Just storing a big yeah. yeah yeah um i mean every once in a while you just like you just you hear about this and it's like yeah yeah bitcoin if 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 bitcoin existed back then you know this this wouldn't we wouldn't be using you know barrels of cash and it's just there, every once in a while when you'll be thinking about oh man should you use bitcoin you, you hear a news story you know this guy should use bitcoin or you know you hear something in the news oh bitcoin subsidy so you know, it's it's it is it is what it is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's that's the beauty of the market is is that even though the government's any state at any given country is doing all sorts of terrible things, it it just creates other opportunities for people to go around it and create create uh create yep. some sort of apparatus to to help people. So it's it's regulatory it's arbitrage, and I mean we've discussed this on Twitter at least you and I. Like to me, like um. It's in the same vein as like you know free trade is 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 regulatory arbitrage in the sense that you know instead of you know something being manufactured in the United States, it is manufactured in a foreign country where the regulatory and economic conditions are more favorable. Um, I consider open borders or free migration to be regulatory arbitrage because it lets somebody substitute the regulations of their home country for the new country they move to, which presumably are are better you know right. more free more you know, freedom. Regulatory arbitrage is the Instead of working through the political system, which, you know, it's very hard for us to convince many, many people out there to become, I mean, I mean, I appreciate all the efforts that you do and all the other go ahead and write about why, you know, economic freedom is great, but <laughs> it's very difficult to change the minds of the vast majority of Americans because Absolutely. they're stuck in their ways. But yep. if you can create a system that they can't control, be it Bitcoin or, um, well, Uber and Airbnb are forms of regulatory arbitrage. You know, they route around taxi and hotel regulations. These systems free us. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about um, just 
people not even realizing that, uh, you know, a transition away from the state is happening. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. if, if they realize what's happening, they're going to, they're going to be very resistant because people don't like typically don't like change. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're just creating like, Oh, here's a better way to, to live your daily life. And they're going to say, Oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Not realizing well, that. the yeah. beauty of Uber every day. People yeah. all the time use it and don't realize what they're doing. Yeah. I yeah. think that's how we will eventually get rid of the state as more and more things like this happen. And we realize we just don't need these people. Yeah. Now the sad thing is the Uber theoretically could be, I mean, if the government wanted to shut down Uber, they would just go and shut it down. If they want to shut down Airbnb. They could, I do not think that Bitcoin can be shut down right. as long as people, as long as people hold the Bitcoin, as long as nobody, there isn't some mass sell off and everybody sells their Bitcoins, literally, Everybody sells their bitcoins until the point where nobody wants it. It comes free again. Bitcoin will always persist. Right. I mean, it works just as well at you know a value of one dollar per bitcoin as it does at two thousand five hundred. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's it's the beauty of not having to keep a uh, paper money in your wallet. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it, it's it's truly a censorship resistant system. I mean, Satoshi really, he really developed a great system. And, you know, as we go, as we go along, you know, the core team is, is slowly pushing out improvements to the protocol. Like I was saying, you know, pro improvements that, you know, make it easier to validate transactions on nodes, improve privacy, and hopefully we'll get that lightning network someday that will, um, that will, uh, that will allow a transaction. In fact, Litecoin already had segregated witness, um, Implemented, so they're they're actually they might already have Lightning Network up and running on there. So nice. it's actually Litecoin makes a very good, you know, if nothing else, Litecoin makes a very good test ground, a test bed for Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, let's see where it goes. Cool. Well, anything else to add on on Bitcoin or any of these all currencies? Any advice? Last advice for for newcomers. Um, only invest what you can afford to lose. Um, uh, you know, if you're going to buy Bitcoin, one thing that might be beneficial is to buy regularly in small increments instead mm-hmm. of all at once. They call they call it dollar cost averaging because what it does is it reduces your exposure to volatility. Yeah, it's very volatile. Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin's very volatile. I recommend going through local Bitcoins instead of Coinbase just because it's more private. If you just pay with cash with your local dealer. Um, I've done it many times. It's safe. Just meet it at a Starbucks. Pick a dealer who has a repu- has a well-established reputation. You know, a lot of them are are reviewed on that site, and then meet them at a Starbucks. Give them cash and just just let them send your their bitcoins to your add to your um to your to your wallet. Um, use a hardware wallet, secure your privacy, seed, and just hold. This whole sounds, sounds like a plan. Like I, I need to get a hardware wallet. <laughs> yeah, yes, so do I. I. The treasure, treasure is a very good one. It's about 120 bucks, but it's well worth it. Worth, worth, worth keeping it safe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I actually have a few of them in case <laughs> I lose one. <laughs> nice. But it's it's a, it's a good device. Well, yep. I like it. Well, thank you, doctor, for joining us. Uh, we yep, really yeah, appreciate you your time. Yeah, yeah. If uh, if we ever need any. Um, any more episodes on Bitcoin? If there's any, any ever any Bitcoin uh, news coming out, or when, when on on August first, when this possibly changes, uh, we may ask you to come back on if you're ever available. Uh, yeah, I'd love to come on. Yeah, every, I can come on. You know, regular basis once every several months just to give it up. So much change. You know, because it's a technical field and technology moves fast, and it's like it's like technology meets politics. There's always something happening, and you know, a week is like an attorney in Bitcoin, in, in Bitcoin land. Yeah, so, lot, lot um, changing. Yeah, so you know, there's always something to update on. Yeah, so I'd love to check in regularly and let you guys know what's going on. Yeah, great, we appreciate awesome. it. And yeah. thanks for your time right, tonight. Yeah, yeah have, have thank a good you. Night. All right, you have a good too. Thanks. Okay, well, that was Vivek Raj talking about Bitcoin and. A little bit about the altcoins this episode. So we thank you for listening, and we also send a big thank you out to Vivek for for being on our show and talking about this stuff. It was a huge help to, I hope, the audience, but also to Slappy and I. I know I I learned a ton. Same about Bitcoin and and everything surrounding it, and and the pertinent information and news going on currently. And I've got to say, it's even inspired me to create 
my own altcoin called Tractor Coin. So, got it in. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed last week, but I also got it. I very, did. I didn't very, want to give you the satisfaction. Very, very sneakily, I got it. I don't think he even... No, he was probably know. thinking, why is this guy thinking about tractors? But <laughs> um, Yeah, so anyway, I learned a ton, and it's a week after we recorded this. I still haven't got my hardware wallet, but I will be getting one. And uh, August 1st is the date he says there's a potential split. So get on it. Absolutely. So, I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I thought it was great. I'd love to have him back on again whenever there's more Bitcoin news. Um, I thought he did a great job. If anyone has questions, feel free to send them to us through mcflugel.com or, or hit up Vivek directly through Twitter. Right. We have his Twitter uh, account linked on the show notes page, mcflugel.com slash 47. Another thing, if you guys are you know listening to these podcasts, you're enjoying it, uh, we'd, we'd love if you leave us some feedback on iTunes or Stitcher and maybe leave a comment. Um, that helps us in the, in the search rankings and make us more yeah. widely available to other people. So if you do that small favor for us, we would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you're out marching around listening and uh, you're not near a computer, you don't want to go to our website, I have his handle here. It's at Vakeraj. That's V-A-K-E-R-A-J. Uh, you can hit him up directly. He knows everything about Bitcoin. Yeah, certainly does. All right, so again, uh, I mentioned the show notes page, but uh, find uh, links to subscribe to the podcast, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and also subscribe to our email list where we send out a kind of a weekly update of, of what's going on the website. So with that, thank you for listening, and we will catch you next week. Peace.